Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Key Strategies for Fraud Detection and Prevention. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams. Ashley Austin, partner with our Government Services Group, and Keith Simovic, Senior Manager with our Government Services Group. With that, I'll turn it over to Ashley to get us started. Thank you, Kendall, very much. And thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. We are so pleased to be with, her, with you today. So first, I wanted to just start off by giving you our roadmap for the morning. First, we'll cover some fraud basics to set the stage. Then we will cover four different case studies, one of which will include some phishing attempt examples and associated red flags. And then we'll close out with some interesting fraud statistics and some final thoughts. So we'll start off with some fraud basics. The Association of Certified Fraud Examiners issues an annual report. It's called the Report to the Nations. It covers numerous items specifically related to the various impacts of occupational fraud. What's listed on this slide is from the 2019 report, but the statistics are relatively similar for 2020, and we actually had to submit our slides a little bit of ahead of the 2020 report being issued. What remains the same is the fact that the impact of fraud is significant. It's a multi-trillion dollar business, now approaching $4.5 trillion rather than the $4 trillion as reported in the 2019 report, as also included on this slide. Organizations lose an astounding 5% of annual revenue to fraud on an annual basis. And in terms of the time it takes to detect a fraud, for frauds committed by executive management, it takes approximately 24 months and then a little bit shorter for frauds committed by managers at 18 months. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fraud triangle pictured on the left-hand side of the screen. It's the cornerstone of fraud theory and illustrates the various elements that need to be in place for a fraud to be perpetrated. You probably recognize it from your accounting classes back in the day if you're a fellow accountant. 
This concept has been at the heart of fraud theory for more than 40 years and includes pressure, opportunity, and rationalization. Pressure is, of course, the private financial need of the individual actually executing the fraud. This could be an individual that's undergoing some type of expensive medical treatment or going through a divorce, for example. Opportunity is the ability to carry out the fraud that's really made possible by a potential breakdown in controls. So here comes the fraud diamond, which was really developed to help not only clarify the concept of rationalization, but enter into capability. Rationalization is not as straightforward as pressure and opportunity, but rationalizing wrongdoing remains a critical characteristic for fraudsters. Many anti-fraud professionals believe there's a new breed of offender, one who simply lacks a conscience that's sufficient to overcome the temptation to commit the fraud. I came across a quote as I was you know, preparing for this webinar, which really helps to illustrate the fraud diamond. So it stated opportunity opens the doorway to fraud and incentive and rationalization or pressure and rationalization draws the person toward it. But the person must have the capability to recognize the open doorway as the opportunity to take advantage of it by walking through it, not just once, but time and time again. So that is capability. Go through a few sets of different types of controls on the next few slides. The first is preventive controls, and they're used to keep a loss or an error from occurring, obviously. Examples of preventive controls are segregation of duties, setting spending limits, establishing pre-approvals or required approvals, and the other items that are listed on this slide. These controls are typically integrated into a process so that they're applied on a continual basis. They're especially common when the risk of loss is considered to be pretty high. So putting these items in place will lower the chances of a loss actually ever occurring. A detective control is designed to locate problems after they have occurred. So once problems have been detected, management can then take steps to mitigate the risk that they will occur again in the future, usually by altering an underlying process. So examples of detective controls include bank reconciliations. They can detect unexpected withdrawals from a bank account. Other examples include variance reporting, budget to actual analysis, surprise cash counts, and one that's not listed on this slide is a physical inventory count, which can spot instances in which the actual inventory, inventory balance is lower than what's stated in the general ledger. While preventive controls are considered to be more pragmatic as they're put in place to prevent any problems from occurring, Detective controls are obviously after the fact. So if the issues they uncover are not remedied quickly, it can lead to additional losses, to the losses that may have already been incurred. A detective control is considered to be less robust than a preventive control, since a preventive control keeps losses from ever occurring, while a detective control may result in initial losses before corrective changes can be implemented. Which brings us to corrective controls or consequences. So they're put into place to correct any errors that were found by detective controls. This type of internal control usually begins by detecting undesirable outcomes and keeping the spotlight on the problem until management can solve it. So if an error occurs, then it's essential that an employee follow procedures that have been put into place to correct the mistake. So examples of corrective internal accounting controls include training, the actual correction of an error, such as posting a journal entry or modifying spending authorities. You know, in light of our current environment, we thought it would be pretty important to highlight the impact COVID-19 is having on internal controls. I know that I've received several questions from clients on how to pivot. In response to this, you know, new normal, we're all experiencing of remote operations during the pandemic. What is critical? is maintaining focus on the effective operation of your internal controls. The shift to, in, to remote operations has likely required you know, adjustments to your in, internal control processes and then ensuring that any additional adjustments that need to be made are timely identified. And that's going to be key to maintaining an effective internal control environment. And while we've been in this you know, remote working environment for almost two months now, it's important to take another look at those controls to make sure that you're evaluating them and not only considering the items on this slide, but also a few of the following items that I'm going to mention. So taking a, a close look at your current closed calendar and considering the impact on the timeliness of your control operations will be important. 
identifying controls with manual approvals and then maintaining those approvals via email, Add, adding new controls where necessary and then documenting changes to current controls, paying close attention to the documentation around management estimates, and then keeping the lines of communication open, not only with the individuals on your finance team and management, but also with your external auditors. Transitioning to a remote environment has likely presented many different challenges to the effective operation of internal controls. So by taking a look at them, uh, identifying obstacles early and adjusting the processes where necessary, keeping the lines of communication open, you can hopefully successfully navigate the reporting and the compliance challenges presented by the new normal of our remote operations. And with that is your broad basics. I will hand it over to Keith to go through our first case study. Perfect. Thanks, Ashley, and welcome, everyone. Um, so now that we've kind of gotten through uh, some of the fraud basics that, again, I'm sure a lot of you are, are aware of a lot of those items with the fraud triangle and the fraud diamond. Uh, but we, what we'd like to do is to kind of take a deeper dive into a, kind of a handful of recent fraud cases uh, that impacted municipal governments across the United States. Um, and as we go through the details of each case, uh, including the who, the what, the where, and the when of each case, uh, you know, try to identify where the red flags were along the way. You know, maybe ask yourself questions like, what processes and controls might have been put in place to, pre to prevent some of these frauds from occurring? Or how could the fraud have been detected earlier on in the process prior to growing into a larger situation? You know, also think about which pieces of the fraud diamond were present. You know, oftentimes in these cases, we find, you know, that in hindsight, that many, if not all of the four corners of the fraud diamond were present. But in the moment, it might be very difficult to identify the presence of each of these traits. Uh, however, I think for this presentation, we want to focus in on the opportunity corner of the fraud diamond. You know, a fraudster could have the pressure and incentives to commit fraud, and they also could be able to rationalize committing fraud in their mind. So they might think, um, um, you know, the organization that they work for is piling on too much work or, or doesn't recognize them for their efforts, they pass them up for a promotion or maybe hasn't given them a pay increase in several years, you know, after feeling this way for, for several months or years, they might be able to rationalize committing fraud. But if they don't have the opportunity or capability to commit fraud, it becomes increasingly difficult for fraud to occur and not be prevented or detected timely. So that means that governmental entities and their system of controls can have a huge impact on whether someone has the opportunity to commit fraud. So with that said, the key question really is to ask throughout each of these cases, uh, you know, where was the opportunity and how did the system of controls fail? Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and jump into the first case study, which takes us to Orange County uh, in the city of Placentia, California. So for the facts of this case, let's start with the main player in the case, Michael Wynn. Now, Michael wasn't someone who transplanted to Orange County from somewhere else right before working in the city. You know, he actually grew up in the area and graduated from Valencia High School. Uh, and he then went on to study at nearby Cal State Fullerton, where he earned his business degree uh, back in 2005. Uh, and after graduating, he decided to stay in the area and, and look for work. And so just three years after graduation, he got a job at the city of Placentia, uh, working initially as a senior accountant before getting promoted to the financial services manager, which really kind of elevated him to the number two role in the finance department, just below the CFO. Now, if we pause there for a second, on the outside, I'd say it, it looked like Michael was doing well for himself and was settling in nicely to his new role at the city while growing his young family at home. Uh, he garnered the trust of his, of his fellow employees at work, and he even earned the city's Employee of the Quarter Award back in April of 2014. Uh, and with his new role, he also took on more responsibility, uh, including becoming a main point of contact at the city's financial institutions. And, and he also played a key role in transacting the city's wire payments. Uh, he had a lot of responsibility at this point, and the city seemed to trust him in this role as the number two employee in finance. So where did things go wrong? Well, over an approximate two-year period, Michael made 36 wire payments from the city to accounts belonging to him and other related individuals and organizations. And overall, he was able to get $5.1 million out of the city's accounts, which he then used for things like gambling, making poor investments, and for helping his parents who had recently gone through bankruptcy proceedings. Now, if we stop there to just think back to the fraud diamond real quick, I think his parents' financial struggles could have been seen as at least one of his rationalizations and incentives to commit fraud in the first place. Uh, it may have been hard for other employees to identify that at the time the fraud was occurring, 
But looking at the situation now and the financial help he provided to his parents, that definitely could have been a, a motivator for him. But so what about opportunity? How did he do it? Well, Michael saw opportunity in several areas. First, he had access to alter the ledgers in the city's financial systems to cover up the payments. That way he could alter the pay or who the payments were being made to and at what amount. Second, he had access to the bank statements. Now, normally that wouldn't be an issue, but in this case, Michael was the only employee who received the statements directly. Uh, th this allowed him to make changes to the statements before copies were provided to others within the department and within the city. One other issue is that given his IT access and understanding of the financial systems, he was able to circumvent controls and sign off as both the initiator and the approver on the fraudulent wire transactions, thus gaining the approval to get significant sums of money out the door without a second set of eyes on them. Now, looking back on this case, it seems like there was a substantial amount of opportunity for someone in Michael's role, given the access he had to the system without additional controls in place to monitor his transactions. So what controls were in place per city policy? Well, prior to the fraud occurring, city policy required that multiple individuals be involved, um, or excuse me, let me go back to a slide here. Um, multiple individuals would be involved with a wire transaction, but then a separate person should be responsible for reconciling the transaction to ensure everything matched. Now, this sounds pretty, pretty good on the surface, but the issue was that given his system access, Michael could initiate and approve a wire and then alter the bank statement um, before another individual checked to make sure the transaction was accurate and matched up with all the internal documentation for the payment. So Michael had the access and therefore the opportunity to circumvent controls and cover his tracks uh, without other employees really knowing about it. So how did he get caught? Well, it's kind of interesting since his scheme was actually identified externally by the FBI given uh, some unusual payment activity they were seeing from the city to some of the separate shell companies Michael was wiring money to on a, on a consistent basis. But once he was caught, he was of course fired immediately from the city and eventually charged and sentenced to 25 years in prison with orders to pay up to uh, upwards of $10 million in restitution and fines to the city. The one thing that I thought was interesting in all of this is that he was able to gain the unwavering trust of his fellow employees, as well as members of the city council, which allowed him to gain the opportunity to commit the fraud. Now the quotes that we've listed on this slide are, are both from a city council member uh, from the city, um, who described him as, you know, a, a nice young man and, and part of a, a normal family. You know, this is very similar to what we typically hear with fraud cases and statistics on this stuff. It's, it's never someone you would expect to find in the newspaper. It's always someone you know and trust, someone who has a family, someone with a great reputation. You know, Michael was able to convince even the council members that he was trustworthy. Uh, but that's exactly why internal controls, especially corrective controls, are, are so important. They can help your organization routinely monitor the controls in place in light of changing risks. And they can help identify where opportunities for errors or fraud exist so the controls can be updated and implemented as new risks pop up. You know, with so many controls in, in an electronic environment today as well, it's really important to assess the IT related risks uh, to understand what controls are in place to monitor user access, among other things. Because in this case, Michael would have had a much harder time doing what he did if he didn't have the IT access to be able to alter the ledgers. And so with that, I'll stop for a minute uh, with all the facts of the case and pass the mic back over to Kendall uh, so we can head to our first polling question. All right, for our first polling question, we have what internal controls were missing? A, no corrective controls. The city should have implemented an internal audit function to help ensure city policies are routinely being followed. B, Need for additional IT review controls. Periodically review reports of changes made to the vendor master file, bank routing information, etc., and changes made to approved records in the general ledger. C. Bank statements were sent directly to only one person who also was able to initiate wire transactions. Bank statements should be sent directly to someone other than the individuals responsible for executing payments. D. All of the above. I'll give you a few moments to respond. To participate, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit.
All right, and I'll pass it back to you, Keith, for the results. Yeah, and it looks like most of you uh, had selected answer D, which is kind of the one that we were thinking about. Not that there's any of these that are a uh, incorrect answer, um, as there was clearly a, quite a few control deficiencies that were present, so all of those could be correct, but uh, that's why we have a uh, response D, all of the above. All right. So moving forward, uh, you know, I wanted to take a moment to revisit the city of Placentia to see, you know, what changes they've made. Oh, let me advance this. Uh, you know, what changes that they've made since all of this went down kind of a few years back. So currently they've taken steps to implement a two-stage password process for any wire transfers. Um, you know, and that was set up to mitigate the risk that someone could have the ability to circumvent controls by both initiating and approving a wire, which was what was happening before with Michael. And on top of that, the city treasurer is now required to be the final approval uh, on all wires as well, which they feel will, will help avoid the possibility of, of any internal manipulation. And then one other key change is that the city now has three employees who receive the bank statements directly, thus making it increasingly difficult for someone to alter the bank statements without one of the other recipients kind of knowing about it. Uh, and finally, the city has now implemented a fraud hotline so that employees and others can report any suspicious behaviors uh, through the proper channel, channels, but also in an, in an anonymous fashion. And so since we mentioned fraud hotlines, you know, we want to pass along some information from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners uh, related to this topic. You know, I, I think a lot of times we hear that fraud cases are most often identified through a random tip. But the information on this slide really puts that into something that's, that's kind of quantifiable. Uh, and what we're seeing here is that when a hotline is present, it provides an anonymous outlet for employees and others where they feel safe about sharing the information with, without the fear of retaliation. Uh, it also shows that a lot of times the frauds are identified earlier when a hotline is present, which we can tell from the fact that the amount of the fraud is typically 50% less in these instances. You know, so with that, you know, the hotline can be a very effective tool. So maybe something to consider if it's not currently uh, one of the tools that your organization is using to fight fraud. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Ashley for the next case study. Thank you, Keith. So the second case study comes to you from the city of Springfield, South Dakota. So I have about three slides of key facts. So just as Keith mentioned, you know, take account of anything that you thought could have been done better, controls that could have been put into place to prevent the fraud as we're going through these, these key facts. So Ashley Press, was the city finance officer for the city of Springfield, South Dakota. She also worked with the ambulance service at the city. And in 2016, she received a debit card to pay for specific ambulance expenses. Unfortunately, she used that debit card to not only pay for meals at ambulance training, but then she would submit a voucher to the city for reimbursement of those meals that had already been paid, so doubling up on the expense. Another example of how she committed this fraud was by booking a hotel room for a meeting that no one planned to attend, and then canceled the room and submitted a claim to the city using only the printout of the email confirmation for the room, rather than the invoice that you receive when you check out of a hotel. She also purchased clothes at a department store in a city that was pretty nearby, uh, indicating they had to stop and buy clean clothes after a transport. But the ambulance crew kept logs of when they would take specific trips and where they went to, and that, that day showed no transport to that specific city. All in all, she stole approximately $40,000. I think it was just shy of $39,000 in a two-year period. So in 2016, she spent about $1,500. In 2017, she spent 10 times that amount. And then in 2018, she just continued to increase her spending. The money wasn't used to, you know, uh, satisfy an addiction problem, a gambling problem. She didn't have anyone that was going through any expensive medical treatments or divorce or financial issues. She really just used the the money is fun money. So she bought candy and beer and cigarettes and perfume and all the things that are listed on this slide. It was a, it's essentially extra disposable income. 
So she did just get punished and was arraigned and um, back early in 2020, I think it was in January 2020. So she has to serve some jail time, serve some probation, has to pay all the money back and also was fined approximately $2,500. So at this point, I will hand the presentation back over to Kendall to administer our second polling question. All right, for our second polling question, we have what controls should the city of Springfield put into place to prevent this fraud? A, restrict use of debit credit cards to only key employees. B, provide board of directors oversight over operations and management. C, issue additional debit cards to employees throughout the city, B, both A and B. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We'll leave the console up for a little bit longer just to give you some time to answer. All right, back to you, Ashley. Thank you, Kendall. Let's take a look at the results. Well, obviously, uh, none, of you, none of you are asleep at the wheel. The answer is both A and B, so thank you. We're just, you know, these are pretty softball questions, just hoping that you can get your CPE here. So let's talk a little bit about the key controls to prevent detect the fraud at the city of Springfield. So one of the more obvious ways Ashley's fraud could have been prevented was by more widely restricting the use of debit cards and spending more time verifying the charges that were made to those cards to ensure they were business related. This could have been accomplished by doing many of the items that are listed on the slide, including limiting the number of cards and users, establishing a policy that cards are for business use only, prohibiting the use of cards for personal purposes within subsequent reimbursement. They could have set account limits with uh, vendors. They could have informed employees of appropriate use of the cards and purchases that are not allowed. They could have required employees to submit itemized original receipts for all purchases, examined credit card statements or debit card statements and corresponding receipts each month, and then also independently to determine whether charges are appropriate and then related to the city's business. Of course, of course, those are all great controls, things that should be in place. But in Ashley's case, she was charging expenses on the city's debit card and then personally requesting reimbursement for that same expense. So in order to prevent that type of fraud, there are other controls that can be implemented that we didn't put a slide together for, but just wanted to verbally talk about. Um, the first item is really maintain a travel reimbursement policy or guidelines that govern this activity. So a really good preventive control. Requiring original documentation. So consider Ashley's reimbursement of the hotel bill. That wasn't original documentation. Initiate a formal review process where a manager above the, above the employee reviews those employees' reports. Create a culture at your organization of regularly questioning expenditures that look extraordinary or a little bit abnormal. Uh, one of the ways that it could have been circumvented entirely is to not issue credit cards at all, have all disbursements made in a formal manner through either accounts payable or payroll. Review the debit credit card activity reports on a monthly basis, like I mentioned um, and included on this slide. Compare that activity to expense reports submitted. And that I think would have caught this fraud that occurred at the city. Annually or at some other reasonable cadence, audit a sample of employees' expense reports and potentially tie that back to the debit credit card activity if they are provided with a debit or credit card. And then treat reimbursement activities consistently by having employees either pay expenditures and seek reimbursement uh, via an expense report or by having the company pay for expenses directly. So flip-flopping between the two could obviously allow for duplicate reimbursement to occur as it did in Ashley's case. So an additional control that could have been put in place was adding additional levels of oversight of city operations and management. So by monitoring the city's financial activity on a regular basis, comparing actual to budgeted revenues and expenses. I mean, Ashley had to have been recording some journal entries to expense the additional funds that she was being reimbursed for. 
requiring explanations of significant variances. There must have been some variance that was unexpected that someone should have caught. And then documenting approval of significant financial procedures and policies, as well as any major expenditures in the board meeting minutes. In Ashley's case, you know, this may have been occurring. Obviously, you have to keep in mind that these are, these are cases that we built off of our own independent research that we did to prepare for this webinar, so we don't have all the facts. Uh, we, you know, read a lot of articles and kind of tried to glean all the controls that should have been put into place. But of course, we think that increasing the level of oversight could have potentially caught the fraud sooner or reduced its duration. So at this point, I will hand it back to Keith to go through our third case study. Perfect, thanks, Ashley. So on our first two case studies, those were both really internal fraud cases, you know, where an employee was able to steal funds from the city that they worked for. Uh, but with so much buzz about cybersecurity, we wanted to take a few minutes to highlight a recent cyber attack on a, on a local government. Um, and I also think this is one is really important right now in light of everything going on with, with COVID-19 and all the news we've been hearing that cyber attacks are, are really on the rise right now, uh, especially in a remote work environment when we might be more susceptible. Unfortunately, a lot of these cases typically point back to someone who received what seemed to be a harmless email and then clicked on a link that put the entire organization at harm. Uh, these cases are becoming all too common in the news, as many of you know, and so it's important to identify what were the red flags and, and then consistently train your teams on what to look out for when reading through their emails. Uh, we'll take a look at a few example emails here shortly as well to give you an idea of, of some of those red flags that we're seeing out there. So the case we selected actually affected multiple cities and not just one municipality. Uh, it was a coordinated attack from August of 2019, so pretty recent. Uh, where cyber criminals targeted 22 governmental entities within the state of Texas, mostly smaller uh, local governments in the state. And on August 17th of 2019, the, act the attackers tried to gain access to their systems, uh, freeze up their data and their ability to transact business, and then demanded $2.5 million in total to return everything to its original state. Now, of the cities affected, some had entire departments completely frozen, including their ability to accept utility billing and other types of payments. The hackers also had access to sensitive customer information that was housed within the utility billing system, which really further puts the city at risk. You know, how did they gain access to the IT systems? Well, they were able to get in once employees at the affected government clicked on a malicious email link or downloaded an attachment. Now, not all of the 22 cities had employees who clicked on the link, so some cities were actually more impacted than others in this attack. Oops, let me go back here one second. So luckily, even for the cities where the hackers were able to access their systems and freeze up operations, state and federal authorities coordinated a quick cyber response plan that allowed them to get the essential systems and data back up and running within just, just a few hours. And by two to three weeks after the attack, all systems were back up and running and back to normal. And another key is that absolutely no money was transferred to the cyber crim criminals in all of this. Uh, so there wasn't really any direct monetary impact to the various cities in Texas. But you might still think about the reputational impact this has had and, what, and whether residents will really still trust the cities with their sensitive information as things continue to recover. So even without a direct financial impact, it's important to think in cases like this how you can continue to protect your organization from such an attack, uh, since it could cause not only that direct, you know, obvious monetary damage to, to a governmental entity, but also a significant uh, reputational harm. And one of the main ways to protect yourself is to be aware of the red flag. So we're going to look at a few real life examples of malicious emails and talk about how we could identify these as potentially harmful. Now, if you were, you know, there in a live classroom setting, you know, I would love to have some table discussions on this and have you guys kind of talk about this and what you're seeing here. But in this environment, I think we'll just point out a few of the things, you know, we're seeing with each of these. And as I read through this, uh, example, I noticed several items that could be seen as possible red flags. First, uh, it looks like there are you know, several grammatical and spelling errors in the body of the text. Um, and for example, in the first sentence, it says, this is my second time of writing you this email since November last year till date, but no response from you. You know, that just doesn't seem like it's your coworker, a trusted vendor, a customer, or, or maybe a friend. Um, and also the nature of the email seems just too good to be true with information like, 
you know, I won in a Euro Millions lottery in January, and I voluntarily decided to donate the sum of 650,000 pounds as my own donation project. You know, that seems awfully nice of them, but if you're not aware of anyone who planned to give you 650,000 pounds for no reason, probably good to, too good to be true. Uh, and then finally, you know, take a look at the link and see if you recognize it before clicking on it. Is this a story or website you're familiar with? And if not, you know, don't click on it and report it to your, to your IT department to vet it further. Moving on to the next example, you know, this one looks like it's some kind of package or maybe a set of documents that's being delivered to you. And you just need to click on the link to access them. And in this case, there's not really much in terms of an actual message or narrative. So the red flags of poor spelling and grammar from the last email, you know, aren't really present here in this example. But think about whether you were expecting to receive anything that you needed to sign electronically. And also, do you recognize the sender? Uh, in any of these emails, you can always hover your cursor over the link to see where the link will actually take you. That way you can see if the website link is something you're familiar with or not. You know, these phishing schemes are getting more and more sophisticated and sometimes the link may look legitimate at first glance, but if you use that trick and hover your cursor over it, you might see that it's someone completely different and not anything that you recognize. So as cyber criminals get more sophisticated with these schemes, so we've got to get our people up to speed on how to look for some of these red flags buried within emails because it's really not there at first glance. All right, and this next one is a perfect example of how these emails can look more and more realistic. And with this one, it looks like it's a legitimate email from American Express with a link to the American Express website. So you can reset your username and password. As you can see here, when you hover over the hyperlink, you can see that the website it will take you to is not really related to American Express and clearly looks fraudulent. Uh, and with something like this, you've got to ask yourself, do I even have an American Express card? And, and if I do, Maybe I should access the American Express website outside of this email or, or call them directly with a number from the American Express website so you can verify the sender. And in any case, it's, it's important to just slow down uh, when going through the emails and, you know, especially ones you're not sure of and look for those types of red flags. And, and when in doubt, call your IT department. They're, they're perfect for, again, uh, kind of vetting through these and seeing if they are legit, legitimate emails or not if it's, if it's in question. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Kendall again uh, and pause for a second for our next polling question. All right, for our third polling question, we have, what were the red flags identified in the phishing attempts just reviewed? A, typos throughout the emails. B, suspicious unknown senders. C, suspicion, suspicious unknown links. Or D, all of the above. For those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. We'll leave it open here for a few more seconds. All right, back to you, Keith. All right, and it looks all of, like all of you, uh, again, not asleep at the wheel. <laughs> Everyone pretty much uh, responded with uh, D, which is all of the above. And even though some of these weren't maybe present on all of the examples, uh, each of these was, was present uh, within, within some of them. So uh, definitely all of these things are, are things to look out for, and all of you got uh, pretty much the right answer there. So. On that, uh, I'm gonna transition back to Ashley to get to our last case study. Okay, thank you so much, Keith. This next case and our final case comes to you from the city of Dixon, Illinois. And you may be familiar with it from the documentary called All the Queen's Horses. We'll go through again, similar to my last case, a few key facts slides, and then uh, go through some of the controls that should have been put into place. So Rita Crunwell began working for the city of Dixon's finance department back in 1970 while she was still in high school. She was appointed the comptroller treasurer in 1983, and the fraud began in December of 1990 when Rita opened a secret bank account, which she alone controlled. 
The city of Dixon had six authentic bank accounts established for general and special purposes, plus the seventh fraudulent account created by Rita. This bank account was short for Reserve Sewer Capital Development Account, RSCDA. So Cronwell began transferring money from the city's authentic accounts to this fraudulent account back in January of 1991. If you haven't seen the documentary or heard of this case before, the fraud was really genius in its simplicity. Rita picked up the Daily Mail, she made all the deposits, she updated the journals and ledgers, she prepared and signed checks, she transferred investment monies between accounts, and she reconciled the bank accounts. She was legit legitimately a one-woman show. She routinely transferred funds from the accounts into the authentic capital development account. Then she would go ahead and create fictitious capital projects and fabricated invoices for these projects. Transfers from the legitimate account, the capital development account, to the fraudulent account were documented as payments of these fictitious invoices. In 1991, Crenwell transferred more than $181,000 to the RSBDA account. As the fraud scheme continued, the amount she still increased to a high of $5.8 million in 2008, and then she took an average of more than $2.5 million a year over the 20-year course of the fraud scheme. As I mentioned on the last slide, Rita created approximately 159 fictitious invoices that were supposedly from the state of Illinois to provide support that the purchase was legitimate. She used much of these dollars to go ahead and fund her quarter horse operation, but also to support a lifestyle that was well beyond her, her means, purchasing several cars, a second house, and a multi-million dollar motorhome. So in all, Rita stole $53.7 million in 22 years. It's the largest municipal fraud in, in the country. So how was Rita caught? Um, Dixon's mayor reported Rita to law enforcement back in the fall of 2011 after another city employee had assumed her duties during one of Rita's extended unpaid vacations. So Rita, whose annual salary was about $80,000 at the time per year, she received four weeks of paid vacation and then she took an additional 12 weeks of unpaid vacation in 2011. So when Rita was gone during one of these unpaid vacations, her replacement requested all of the city's bank statements. And after reviewing them, obviously the employee saw the unauthentic bank account, the fraudulent account, and brought the records to the attention of the mayor, who called in the FBI, who then did a six month um, analysis and tried to gather as much data as they could to build a case against Rita. And then they eventually charged her in and took her into uh, law enforcement in the fall of 2011. So at this point, I'm gonna pass the baton back to Kendall to administer a last polling question. All right, for our fourth and final polling question, we have, what were the missed red flags in this case? The options are A, lack of segregation of duties, B, Ms. Crenwell took four months of vacation annually. B, Rita appeared to live outside her means. D, all of the above. Once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. We'll leave the console open here for a few more seconds. Provide time to answer. All right, back to you, Ashley. Okay, thank you, Kendall. Let's take a little look. Yep, D, all of the above. I tried to mention all of the items that were listed as options. So let's just go through quickly the misread flags here. So Rita was arrested, charged, convicted, imprisoned, ordered to pay the money back. Um, although the city did receive some of the stolen funds back in a settlement, the incident 
as you can imagine, shook the confidence in Dixon's municipal government. So additionally, the impact on the city was pretty devastating. Roads were in disrepair, ambulances and police radios needed to be replaced. The infrastructure was, it was in shambles. Um, the cash flow problems that were caused by the fraud were attributed to a slowdown in tax collections as a result of the economic downfall. It happened over the course of the Great Recession, 2008 to you know 2011. Unlike a commercial entity where the cash flow is generated by selling a product or service, the typical government relies on tax collections from citizens as the primary source of cash flow. So the mayor and council members ultimately believed Rita's explanation that the city's residents were behind in their payments um, and also ignored the red flags, which were that Rita had the sole responsibility of the town's finances, that she took on average four months of vacation annually, most of which was unpaid, and that she lived lavishly and much beyond her means. The city of Dixon was pretty small, so everybody knew about her quarter horse operation. So um, it was just assumed that she had inherited the money. So obviously the most significant control missing at the city of Dixon was a system of checks and balances to ensure that no person had control over all parts of a financial transaction. Had a simple set of segregation of duties been present, the fraud potentially would have been caught much sooner. Um, really making sure that the same person isn't authorized to write and sign a check, that they aren't allowed to open the mail and reconcile the bank account. Um, that if any, you know, require independent check of work being done by a board member or someone above, above the individual doing the reconciliation. As a result of, of this particular fraud, changes were made to internal controls at the city of Dixon, as you might imagine. They switched from several bank accounts to a single account. Paper checks are no longer allowed. Duties are properly segregated, and those with responsibilities over cash require supervision by a city administrator. Rita's position of comptroller was replaced by a finance director position, and the council appointed an independent panel to oversee financial reporting. In addition, the state of Illinois passed into law a requirement that the annual audited financial statements be presented to each member of the city council or county board in a public meeting. Other laws have since been introduced to require tougher penalties for municipal embezzlement. So pretty simple control that should have been in place, but that just wasn't um, due to lack of oversight and potentially just um, too much trust in one individual at, the, at this particular organization. So at this point, I will pass it back to Keith for some statistics and final thoughts. All right, perfect, Ashley. Um, so before we let you guys go, you know, we just want to go over some interesting facts with the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners um, that they published in their report to the nations uh, that they kind of get all this information based on a, on a global fraud survey that they, that they put out there every so often. Um, you know, I think there's some interesting stats in here, including the fact that fraud can really impact any organization in any industry and, and in any country. And, and some of those stats here kind of show that. Uh, the financial impact is often significant, uh, with the median impact being $130,000 in reported fraud cases, and almost a quarter of all fraud cases being greater than $1 million. Uh, so without some uh, of the control, you know, prevention and detection tools in place that we've talked about today, the median fraud scheme can go undetected for a significant amount of time at around 16 months, uh, which is fairly lengthy. And one thing that stands out on this next slide is that tips are by far the most common detection method at 40%, uh, with employees providing more than half of all tips in fraud cases. Uh, also, organizations with fraud hotlines detect fraud by tip 46% of the time, uh, compared to just 30% of the time when fraud hotlines aren't present. Uh, you know, this is really shown to be an effective tool at detecting fraud and stopping it before the impact. Uh, to the governmental uh, entity becomes even larger, you know, over that span of, you know, the median span of, of 16 months that some of these things can, can go on until they're detected. And one main thing we want to leave you with is to continue to be vigilant in the current environment we're in right now. You know, with organizations and local governments needing to take cost-cutting measures uh, it, amidst the impact of, of the coronavirus, think about the impact this will have on employees and the pre pressures and rationalization uh, those two corners of the fraud diamond. 
you know, think about things like how the organization is able to still consistently apply strong internal controls when a significant portion of the workforce is working remotely. And also think about the organization's risk assessments and, and really those corrective controls in place. What monitoring functions have taken place uh, to identify and assess new risks that may have popped up in this remote work environment? Where do the opportunities now exist that may not have been present just a couple of months ago uh, but before we all really started working you know, remotely for the first time? And, and really, in addition to all of the other significant discussions going on right now with, with costs being cut, budgets being adjusted, employees working remotely, now is also the time to be talking about risk management as it relates to internal controls uh, and effective fraud prevention and detection, uh, including prevention of, of cyber threats, like we talked about a little bit. Uh, and one thing that I'll leave you with is that although we can't really control the, the fact that many of us will be facing increased financial pressures uh, as a result of the COVID-19 outbreak, we can control the opportunity for fraud to occur with careful review of internal controls uh, in light of this current situation. Uh, so thank you all for, for your time today, and we hope to have you back on, on one of our other webcasts in the near future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kendall for, for some final comments. All right, thank you, Keith. It looks like we still have some time left for Q&A. We will start here. It looks like there was a few questions regarding one of the cases. Um, why was taking leave a red flag? From what I understand, usually not taking leave generally considered a red flag, or is it because it was unpaid? Thank you, Kendall. I'll go ahead and take that question. Uh, yes, it, the red flag was the fact that it was unpaid. and. Uh, her salary com combined with the fact that she was taking so much time unpaid was definitely a red flag. I think it is true that if an employee does not take vacation at all, that too is a red flag. But in this particular instance, combined with all of the other uh, missed red flags that were in Rita's case, you know, uh, no segregation of duties, living well beyond her means of her $80,000 salary, and then taking all of that unpaid vacation was, was why it was considered a red flag. All right, great. For our next question, in our paperless world, what alternatives are there to original receipts? We still ask for them in addition to receipts that are scanned into our system. We would like to get away from that, but are not sure how. And I'll, I'll take that one too, Kendall, thank you. So, you know, I, I don't know what type of organization this person is, is from who is asking the question, but um, if you receive federal funds and expend federal funds, unfortunately, at this point in time, it's really not advised to go away from original receipts. I, as you, as you know, for those people that do receive and expend federal funds, you must have an itemized receipt to support the fact that there was no unallowable items uh, purchased and then reimbursed by the federal government. Specifically, one of those, you know, main examples is if you were to purchase alcohol and then ask to be reimbursed, that is a no-no. So at this point, it is still advised to continue to ask for original receipts. I know that that's obviously painful in our paperless world, especially in this remote working environment. But again, if you receive and expend federal funds, you, you really need to include an original receipt that's itemized. Thank you, Ashley. For our next question, is fraud more likely in government positions, such as cities, states, et cetera? If so, why do you think that is? Yep, and I can go ahead and take that one. Um, you know, I think with those last few slides that we had, uh, that had the stats on, um, you know, from the, from the report to nations that the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners put out there, you know, it just really tells you that any industry is impacted by this, and government is definitely one that, uh, is, is part of that and can be impacted by it, but I don't know that it's necessarily uh, more susceptible to fraud than, than other organizations, although you might think about it from the, from the perspective of, um, you know, a government does have access to sensitive information on some of its residents. Uh, you think of if, if there's, you know, utility billing operations and things like that, that they might have access to, to sensitive customer information in there. You know, there might be uh, more susceptibility or they might be more of a target from that perspective. 
Um, but, you know, governments, just like any other organization, uh, are targeted uh, in, in instances of fraud um, and, and cyber fraud as well. Um, so it's something to always kind of be vigilant of and, and keep an eye out for. Um, I know I have seen uh, stories recently that government, at least cyber threats, have been on the rise over the course of the last year to two years. Uh, now, why that is, I, I don't know. Um, but that is something that uh, it, it continues to be a target, just like all the other kind of stores that you hear about out there, you know, target getting hacked and, um, you know, other organizations and stuff like that. And so governments, you know, are just as susceptible to, to fraud and, and cyber threats occurring. Thank you, Keith. For our last question, we have regarding one of the cases, did they not have web access to the banking activity? Yeah, I'll take that one. I, I think that all had to do with the first case that we went through, uh, the one about Michael Wen um, and some of the uh, wire payments that he had going out the door and the, his ability to alter some of the ledgers, uh, both internally and alter some of the bank statements since he was the only one that received the bank statements directly. Um, but you think about, well, what if, you know, what if they had, you know, web access or whatever to view the banking activity, um, you know, wouldn't someone else be able to kind of see what the true activity was and be able to catch it that way? Uh, and the, the honest response is that we don't, we don't know from the information that we've been able to gather that's out there. Uh, we don't, we don't know. Um, I would definitely think that if there is web access, that is kind of something where uh, if multiple individuals, as long as multiple individuals have access to it and do uh, regularly check it or if you have someone that's you know performing that reconciliation um, that they're able to go independently go on that website and pull the information down rather than getting it um, from a from someone from another employee at the city um, you know i think that's a good control to have in place you know in this case um, they did have a separate person that was required to go through and reconcile any any uh, wire activity um, but again they were getting hard copy bank statements um, from Michael Wen. And so he was able to doctor those up before he gave them to that uh, other employee to do that reconciliation. But if that employee was able to have that web access, well then he, they could go directly to the website and, and pull that down. But I don't, I don't know. Um, I would imagine that that wasn't a possibility or if it was, um, the other employees probably didn't have that level of access that they couldn't go on there and, and pull that information down that maybe that was limited to just uh, Michael or maybe uh, maybe some others that maybe the CFO or something like that, but maybe the CFO wasn't on there, you know, scanning through transactions and things like that. So uh, we, we don't have all the facts in that case, but I think that would be a good control to have in place if you have someone else doing a reconciliation that they can go online. You know, they don't have to have the bank set statement sent to them directly along with, you know, two other employees uh, that they can have access and go online directly. Uh, and just maybe just have that read only access, be, but be able to pull up uh, true information from the bank uh, in a live format. Great, thank you, Keith. Thank you both for a great presentation today. If you submitted a question that we did not get to, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast, or you may reach out to the presenters directly. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next time.